in the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. Assalamu alaikum respected viewers. I am Sadiq Farooq, Assistant Professor of English in Higher Education Department of the Government of the Punjab. As you know, we have been talking about history of English literature and linguistics along with vocabulary and grammar in our series of lectures that is uh, meant to be very helpful for the candidates of lectureship in English. Our previous lecture, lecture 12, on English literature was about Edmund Spencer specifically and at the end of that lecture I mentioned categorically that my next lecture would be on Sir Philip Sidney. So keeping that in view, I hope you must have studied something about uh, this writer Sir Philip Sidney. Now who Sir Philip Sidney was, let's uh, talk a bit about him. Sir Philip Sidney was a social, political, courtly, military and of course a literary figure in the history of English literature. He has a very prominent uh, uh, status and it is extremely unfair to ignore him uh, in history of English literature. Some of his prominent works are Arcadia, Apology for Poesy and Astrophil and Sonnets that is a collection of sonnets and some lyrics. At the end of this lecture you are also going to have some vocabulary items so that you can also prepare for some uh, word prayer. And before moving ahead as always my request is to please subscribe uh, my channel if you have not already done it and also hit the bell icon that is present just beside that uh, subscribe button so that you do not miss my future lectures whenever I upload them you will get a notification so that will be a great way to be connected. So let's move to question number one. It states uh, Philip Sidney was born in 1554 and he died from a fatal wound received in a minor battle before the city of Zutphen. This city is actually uh, in modern day Netherlands. In the Netherlands. Now the question simply is when did he die? Right? The year of his death has to be guessed from the given series of years. The first uh, year is 1593. This is not correct. 1666 is also not correct. 1599 again not correct and 1586 is a correct option. And all the other years are also the years of death. 1593 is the year of death for Christopher Marlowe. 1616 was the year when William Shakespeare died and 1599 was the year when Edmund Spencer died. So 1586 was the year when uh, Sir Philip Sidney die, died. Next question says Sidney was a versatile social character. As I have already mentioned in the introduction to this writer. Now you have to choose the role that Sidney never performed. Did he never perform a role of diplomat? No it is not correct. He certainly was a diplomat. He was a courtier. This courtier was actually <coughs> C option but this is not correct and a soldier definitely he was a soldier uh, we can't say that he never performed this role so again it is not correct and duke was option he never had been a duke so this is the correct option so Sir Philip Sidney definitely remained a diplomat soldier courtier but he never remained a duke the next question Number three, how many of Sidney's works were published during his lifetime? Four, nine, seven or none of these. So the matter of fact is that there was no publication of his works during his lifetime. So the answer is zero. None of these because the answer is zero. Right? How many of his works? No works. All of his works were published after his death. Next question 4 is Astrophel and Stella as I have told you that his, he is famous due to his three prominent works Arcadia, Astrophel and Stella and Apology for Poesy. Now Astrophel and Stella was a collection of sonnets by Sidney. When was this collection published? So 
first thing is <coughs> very clear that I have told you in the previous question that none of his works was published during his lifetime. So the first option says 1580, but Philip Sidney died in 1584. It means that this option cannot be correct. And so is the, the case with 1582. This option can also be not correct because he died in 1584. And uh, 1588 and 1591 are the two options from which you can uh, choose your right answer. So the right answer is 1590. One. This is the year when Astrophel and Stella was published. The next thing is, the sonnets in Astrophel and Stella are autobiographical in subject matter. With Astrophel being Sidney himself, right? Astrophel was allegorical, um, I mean, uh, symbol of for Sidney himself, Philip Sidney. And who was Stella? This is the question. Who was Stella? This is ha this has to be guessed. This figure. Now, she was engaged to Sydney but later married Lord Rich. This is a hint for who Stella was. Now, was it Eleanor Luna, Emily Dickinson, Penelope Deveros, or Isabel Edward? The right option here is Penelope Deveros. All the other options are, of course, Emily Dickinson. Uh, again, she was a poetess and uh, she wrote a lot later when after the death of Philip Sidney so definitely she did not have any connection with Sir Philip Sidney. Next question is 6. Sidney married in 1583 a year before his death. Now who was his wife? Frances Walsingham, Penelope Deveros, Elizabeth Boyle or Elizabeth Barrett. Now, the correct option here is the first option Frances Walsingham. Because uh, we have already studied in the previous question that she was engaged to Sidney but later on married Lord Rich. So, it means that Penelope Devereux, this option cannot be correct. Yes, Sidney loved her but he could not marry her. Elizabeth Boyle, she was wife of Edmund Spencer. Elizabeth Barrett, she was wife of uh, Robert Browning. Again, not correct option here. There are 11 songs and how many sonnets in Astrophel and Stella? I told you that this work is actually a collection of sonnets and some lyrics, some songs, right? And now the correct option here is without any discussion. It is 108. There are 108 sonnets and 11 songs. How many songs are there? 11 songs are there and 108 sonnets are there in Astrophel and Stella. Question 8. What was the commonest rhyming scheme employed by Sidney for his sonnets in his Astrophel and Stella? Astrophel and Stella, you know, collection of songs and sonnets. So, what was the rhyming scheme that he employed there? Rhyming scheme that he employed there was alpha option. A, B, B, A, then again repeated, then C, D, C, D, and then E. Question 9. Sidney's most famous sonnets starts with it starts with the following line. Leave me, O love, which reaches but to dust. What do the words imply? What do we get? What do we understand from these lines? What is the uh, most likely interpretation of this line? An out and out denunciation of love. Denunciation means leaving aside, giving up. Cruelty of love especially when not attained. Repudiation of human love in favor of divine love or none of these interpretations is correct. Well actually this line, uh, this part of the line reached but to dust. That returns to uh, soil. It means that he is talking about human love and he is repudiating, rejecting that love in favor of divine love, right? He says that the love that we harbor for a human being is destined to return to soil. That, that is why we must uh, direct that love to God Almighty. Question 10 says, Arcadia is the longest of Sidney's all works. It was written in the form of prose romance. Right? This is a very important thing that you must remember that it was form in the form of prose. 
pastoral romance is also, is also called whom did he dedicate the work <clears throat> his younger sister mary sydney the countess of pembroke his wife frances walsingham his love penelope uh, devereux or his friend sir walter raleigh the answer is alpha option right his younger sister mary sydney and she was commonly known as the countess of pembroke actually the published name for this work was countess pembroke's arcadia next question 11 asks arcadia was written in two versions the first one was called old arcadia and of course naturally the second version was called new arcadia the old arcadia was written in 1570s but published only in 1926 remember it it was only in 1926 that old arcadia could manage its publication the second incomplete version was published first in 1590 and then by his sister who was his sister mary sydney the countess of pembroke and she was also a minor literary figure in that age and also she helped uh, that work being published in 1593 this is the correct option b to option 1593 question 12 basilius was the king of arcadia in story he had two daughters pamela and philoclea electra sophia or rhea correct option is philoclea l option is correct arcadia was a place actually and uh, in that place basilius was the king and he had two daughters the name of his first daughter was pamela and the other daughter was philoclea 13 in arcadia yorcus was the king of which place utopia utopia is any place that has ideal system in politics traditions religion etc arcadia but we have already studied that basilius was the king of arcadia so this option at least cannot be correct and utopia actually this was no, no place in history it was just in an imaginary uh, figment of imagination now macedonia or sparta this these two options remain and of these two options macedonia is actually correct b option is correct The next thing in the revised new arcadia sydney introduced two important new characters one of them was basilius sister in law the name of that sister in law was cecropia or cecropia whatever you pronounce it now who was the other first character who was, that was introduced in new arcadia was sister in law of basilius and the other character was cecropia's brother antonius cecropia's son and fearless this is the correct option actually b to option right and basilius uncle creon or basilius sister joselin 15 how did milton appraise right evaluate arcadia when amatorius poem amatorius amatrius or amatorius amatrius whatever you pronounce it is from mating and that is from love making in which there is a lot of mention a uh, lot of uh, talk about love making and a book full of worth and wit or both and b and a rambling narrative sense unity actually we have to keep in mind the fact that john milton uh, studied this work arcadia and also he was influenced a lot by this work so the correct uh, option is actually the both a and b is charlie option he sometimes called it vain a matrius poem and then a book full of worth and wit he could not have called that a rambling narrative or sense sense means without unity now defense of poesy was written by sydney in early 1580s published in which year it was published in 1500 95 correct option is this next what is the rhyming scheme in the shakespearean sonnets right shakespearean sonnets has the rhyming scheme that has 
a very simple pattern of A B A B C D C D E F E F and then G and G couplet at the end. Hero and Leander is a narrative poem, right? It is a poem, narrative poem. There is a sort of story in it, and of eight hundred lines. This is also a piece of information for you people. Now, the authorship is in question. Who wrote it? Lord Brooke, Fog Gravel, Christopher Marlowe, or Sir Walter Raleigh? This theme of hero and leader was derived from Greek mythology, in which <coughs> hero was actually a girl, female, and leader was a man. Right, and uh, sort of love story also. And the writer was none other than Christopher Marlowe. Actually, I included this question just in order to prepare you people for the uh, next thing that is going to come in our upcoming lecture of English literature. That will be in lecture sixteen, and for that thing, you must read drama and some of its history. And then, of course, Christopher Marlowe was a great figure as far as English drama is concerned. So let's move on to the next question, the next portion uh, rather, uh, in this lecture that is going to be vocabulary. First word is impoverish. You have to guess the meanings of this word. This word, as far as its part of speech is concerned, is a verb, and the practice of obtaining by violence or compulsion. Is it the meaning of this word impoverish? No, because the practice says that it is a noun. To make yes, this can this is a verb, and this can be the correct answer. To make indigent or poor, indigent and poor again both mean the same thing. Property in general, this is a noun. No need to read it further on. An open structure again a noun. An employment again it is a noun. So there is only one verb. So the uh, choice is very easy for us. That the only verb that is present here is <coughs> to make indigent or poor. Inquisitive. It is from inquire. Inquire means to know about. So inquisitive is a person who is very curious about many things, who wants to know, he wants to get knowledge about that thing, etc. So to misunderstand, uh, this is can this cannot be right. Inquisitive is an adjective, so we need an adjective. To misunderstand, misunderstand is a verb. Given to questioning, especially out of curiosity. Right, very good answer. Having courage or spirit, no. This uh, this is the meaning of brave or courageous. The department of natural science that treats of the uh, constitution and structure of the earth. It is uh, most probably about geology. A very detestable act or practice. So correct option here is of course B option. Given to questioning, especially out of curiosity, is a person who is called inquisitive. Evanescent is it is from evade. Evade is uh, a cousin of avoid. Evanescent as anything that is uh, hard to understand, hard to grasp, hard to catch hold of, and it is an adjective. A simplified representation cannot be correct answer because it is a representation and it is a noun. We need an adjective. Fleeting is an adjective, present participle, derived adjective. This can be correct, and of in fact, it is correct. Expedient or other other things cannot be correct. Archipelago. Archipelago is a group of islands or a, a piece of water in which there a, there are a lot of islands. So let's uh, move on to uh, choosing the right answer. The state of possessing adequate skill or knowledge for the performance of a duty, a uh, bunk or bed in a vessel, sleeping car, etc. Sweat, unwillingness, or any large body of water studded with islands or the islands collectively themselves. Yes, this is of course the right answer. E option is correct. Senile. Uh, this is actually the mental feebleness that results from old age, and it is definitely inevitable result of old age. More distant or advanced, forcible encroachment or trespass. Expressive of positive command, as distinguished from merely directory. Subtle contrivance used to gain a uh, gain a point, or a peculiar or to proceeding, proceeding from the weakness or infirmity of old age. Yes, this is the correct option. 
causing sleep or sickness what is the word for this expression causing sleep or sickness apt is appropriate adamant is a sort of uh, stubborn or furtive is secret omnipotent is a uh, person or power that has power over everything and soporific is our answer actually soporific is anything that causes sleep or sickness to calm or soothe what is the exact word for this prudent is somebody who is very wise fastidious is neat and clean who cares about uh, even minor details emphatic is uh, having stress in it is by birth and mollify is actually the correct option here calm or soothe to decrease the intensity of something next option says an absurdly ridiculous situation what is the exactly one word for this expression so reclamation reclaim anything force can be so insightful state is a person who is very graceful and in great is ungrateful person so the right answer here is farce b to option is correct option all the other options are incorrect leaders of now sentence completion leaders of religious cults maintain what over their fellow followers by methods that can verge on brainwashing homogeneous simulated emulate ascendancy nominal homogeneous means anything that has an even or equal constitution uh, throughout its uh, composition for example a mixture or even a society is homogeneous if there is a equal distribution of every race and every ethnicity simulated is copied resembling emulate means again imitate ascendancy is correct option here nominal is uh, just by name not worth mentioning even ascendancy power he incurred the dash of the ruling class because he advocated limitations of their power scrupulous conscientious indict blame eradicate abolish animosity enmity equivocal clear categorical very easy option again and we are talking about enmity he incurred the enmity he invited the enmity of ruling class because he advocated limitations of their power the dash of old man hoarded his coins not out of uh, prudence but out of greed right what kind of old man a plom is a self confident person so can we say the self confident old man hoarded his hoarded means collected gathered voracious means greedy banal means anything that uh, has uh, lost its effectiveness due to being mentioned again and again miserly is somebody who is close fisted and verbose is some person or anything that has a lot of words correct option of course is voracious that uh, the old man was greedy although he was angry the teacher refrained avoided from avoided refrained from means avoided when he addressed the class loquacious loquacious means talkative right loquacious is talkative can we say refrained from talkative talkative is an adjective but as uh, you can see from is preposition and we need a noun here right preposition plus noun or noun phrase is equal to preposition phrase so uh, we can say that there can be no verb or adjective here the next two words beta and charlie are actually verbs so there should be hardly any doubt regarding their rejection because both of them they mean criticize frivolity means carelessness again it is a noun and uh, we can say it is a uh, suitable candidate as far as its placement here in this blank is concerned but it means carelessness he refrained from carelessness no not correct option the only correct option that remains is agreeably bitterness so this was today's lecture respected viewers i hope you like it and if you uh, did like it then do not forget to put a thumbs up below this lecture and also tell me about your views and opinions in the comment section do come there in comment section or if you do not find it appropriate you can uh, contact me on my facebook id that is present on this screen so uh, next lecture on linguistics uh, i as i have already told you 
it is going to be on socio linguistics so keep in mind and read something about that topic and we will have some quite useful discussion in this topic so till that lecture goodbye take care